requesting. Maybe please kneel as we open this morning's worship. Father in heaven, as we worship you, we invite your spirit to come not in, only into our church, but into our hearts as well. May we be ready to accept your words and let them transform us so that we can have close fellowship with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Step down into darkness Open my eyes, let me see Beauty that made this heart adore you Hope of a life spent with you Here I am to worship Jesus, 
song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, to the heart of worship. And it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. Please be seated. It's offering time, and every week when this time comes along, it's a habit for your right hand to go into your left pocket at the back and pull out a note. Well, it's good to form this kind of a habit to give to the Lord. But let's look at what you give to the Lord. At least be conscious of it. Okay. Don't let it be so automatic that you don't think about it. Our ushers will come and collect your offering. And I'm sure God will be very happy to receive what you want to give back for the gospel, uh, spreading of the gospel. Thank you. Shall we pray? Our gracious Father, once again, it is a privilege to give back to you what you have so generously given to us during this week. We pray for your blessing upon the offering and also upon those whom the offering will benefit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Justice and praise be 
become my embrace to love you from the inside out you will above all else my purpose remains the art of losing myself will shine when all else fades never ending your glory goes beyond all things my heart and my soul I give you control consume me from the inside out Lord let justice and praise become my love you from the inside out. Everlasting, your light will shine when all else fades. Never ending, your glory goes beyond all fame. And the cry of my heart is to bring you praise from the inside out. Lord, my soul, rise out. Everlasting, your light will shine when all else fades. Never ending, your glory goes beyond all fame. And the cry of my heart is to bring you praise from the inside of Lord, my soul cries out. Almighty God in heaven, blessed be your name. Thank you for giving us blessings of health, love, and opportunity to come back to this church again to praise and worship you. Lord, I pray you be with this congregation as we live our individual lives, being your stewards and doing our best in whatever we do, or we glorify your name with our efforts. Lord, today I'd like to pray that you forgive us for all we have done wrong in your sight. Give us the wisdom to not make such mistakes again, seeking your guidance and living your lives the way you want us to. Today we would like to pray for Fred and Grace Lam. Lord, be close to them as they walk with you. Be there in every moment of their lives. Guide them and protect them. And may, them, may they continue to serve you. We would also like to pray for the medical staff around the world, Lord. Be with them as they continue to sieve out and contain the COVID-19. COVID Give them the protection and courage they need. Finally, we would like to pray for Rolf Gerber, who will be preaching to us later. Bless his words and, that, and may they reach us helping us to understand what your message is so that we may apply these lessons in our daily walk with you. Thank you for listening to our prayer and asking request, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Incline
the children uh, in their places at the front. So nice to see them. But very sorry, no, no children's story for you. All right. Uh, there's no Palak, no children's division program upstairs. There's a lot of things missing. And I think it is not really very, very nice, right, for children. But you know, when I saw the children out there during offering time, I tell you, I saw one of them. I won't tell you who put a very big offering up, uh, envelope into the, the offering bag. I don't know what's inside, but I know there's a very big heart inside there, right? <laughs> well, good to see the children uh, sitting in front, even though there's no uh, children's story. I'm sure uh, we try to get the children's story back as soon as possible, all right? As soon as it's pos- uh, the situation changes a little for the better, uh, I will urge the pastor to see how soon he can get it back for the children. Now, uh, before uh, Pastor Rolf Gerber <laughs> speaks to us today, <laughs> i like to read the uh, text. The text is listed on the board, but not the whole, the words of the, uh, the text. So I will just read it from the bulletin. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Thank you, Rolf. Good morning, everybody. Uh, also, a very warm welcome to the ones who watch us uh, live on the stream. Uh, my wife, actually, she is in Frankfurt. She is seven hours behind, but she said if she couldn't, if she couldn't sleep, she would watch me. <laughs> I said, uh, you better sleep. Uh, it's more important. Actually, my cousin is 18 years old, and yet he is six years older than me. Why are you shaking your head? Today, he celebrates his 18th birthday. He is 72. So it's the 29th. You know, you guessed it. Now let me see how I get this work. Here we go. It's the 29th of February. He is is called one of, he is actually called a leapling because this year we have a leap year. And all the ones who have birthday on the 29th of February, they're called Lieblings. So he is a Liebling. Actually, did you know that only 5 million people in the world have birthdays on the 29th of uh, February? Only 5 million. Actually, the chance that you are born on the 29th of February is 1 in 1,500. So quite rare. So I can congratulate my cousin. I did already, although he is still sleeping. He is in Switzerland uh, on his 18th birthday. Now, when the pastor asked me to preach today, I was very hesitant. Actually, I already preached two months ago, shortly before Christmas, and I didn't want you to expose you again to my rumblings, you know. So I said, actually, no. Uh, uh, please pick someone else. But then he said, you know, it's a a once-in-a-lifetime chance to (laughs) preach on the 29th of February. And it's actually true. It will take another 28 years before the next Sabbath falls on the 29th of February. And by then, if I'm still around, I will certainly not preach anymore. (laughs) So, my sincere apologies. I fell for his reasoning. My apology is that you have to put up with me again. Since we're on it, do you know, and this is just a small excourse, do you know why we have leap years? You think you know, but it's actually not as easy or not as straightforward as you think it is. Hence, I thought it might be worthwhile to watch just a two-minute video. Now. I have to give a small disclaimer here. Since this is a live stream from the BBC website, we are unable to stream it 
to the audience watching us. So please bear with us for two minutes as we try to stream that video. Twenty twenty is a leap year. That means there's an extra day in the calendar, the 29th of February. But why do we have leap years? And how do we decide when to have them? The answer is a little more complicated than you may think. So here's how it works. We measure a day as how long it takes the Earth to spin once on its own axis. That's 24 hours. And we measure a calendar year as how long it takes the Earth to orbit the sun, 365 days. Except the time it actually takes for the Earth to circle the sun is 365.24 days. So that's roughly a quarter of a day longer, which adds up to a full day every four years. To keep everything in sync, this full day is added to the fourth year's shortest month, February. And that's what we call a leap year. But we don't actually have a leap year every four years. And here's why. Remember how we rounded up that 0.24 to a quarter? Well, that difference does eventually add up, pushing the whole system out of sync again by three days out of every 400 years, to be precise. In order to redress this slight imbalance, we have to skip a leap year every now and then, so not add that extra day. But how do we decide when to have a leap year and when to skip? The first rule is that the year to add an extra day must be divisible by four. The second rule is that a leap year cannot fall on a year that's divisible by 100. If it does, no leap day is added to that calendar year. But to make things even more complicated, there's an exception to this second rule. If a leap year can be divided by 400, the leap day is added after all. That's why a leap day happened in the year 1600 and 2000, but not in 1700, 1800 or 1900. We have Pope Gregory XIII to thank for creating this century rule some 400 years ago. His changes mark the beginning of the Gregorian calendar, which is still in use across the world today. So, leap years exist to help us stay in sync with the real astronomical year. And if you want to get real nerdy, there's also the more recent introduction of leap seconds. But maybe we'll explain that another year. Did you get it? <laughs> well, you don't have to worry. The next time we skip a leap year, it'll be, unless there are medical miracles happening, it'll be beyond our time. So let's enjoy the leap year as it comes every four years, the 29th of February. But let's get back to... Nothing happens. The slide doesn't leap. <laughs> ah, oh, here we go. Let's go back to the fake news. And the term fake news has actually become very popular, especially since we had a head of state uh, who actually uses this term quite frequently and unfortunately also quite indiscriminately. How susceptible are you to fake news? Let's see how good you are to distinguish fake news. From real. Oh, yeah. Maybe you have to help me. This doesn't seem to work. Okay. You know all. You all know what that is. Um, it's the coronavirus or COVID-19. So here we go. The news is that within four to six months, we actually have a vaccine, which will help us to overcome that problem. Fake? Some people say it's real. It's real? What is it? It's actually half, half. Yes, laboratories, universities, and pharmaceutical companies are working on a vaccine. Yes, they have decoded the DNA of the virus but they will have to test it on animals before they actually can test it on humans. That will all take a while. So realistically, even if we have a vaccine, it will probably take another one and a half years until we have it for use with humans. So 
half right, half wrong. Okay, I'll, I just need to nod the head. Thank you. Here we go. This is the highest mountain in the Alps. It's the Mont Blanc. It's 4,810 meters. Now in a time span of 16 years, a passenger plane, actually, or with a time span of 16 years, two passenger planes crashed at the exact location into the same mountain and they belong to the same airline. <laughs> Not true. Not true. The probability for this to happen is more than one in a million. But I'm afraid to say it's actually true. And I was hesitant to use it, but because the probability is so high, I thought I'd use it. In 1950, a Lockheed Constellation, you know, this is famous plane with the three tails at the end. The oldies of us will know what kind of plane that is. Actually flew in that mountain, killing all passengers on board, uh, roughly about 50. And 16 years later, a Boeing 707 of the same airline flew into that mountain at the exact same spot, killing all 120 people on board. And in both cases, the pilots thought they had actually surpassed that mountain and starting to descend into the Geneva airport. But in both cases, their visual and their instruments were wrong, and they started to descend before, actually, the mountain. Had, they had passed the mountain, and that's why they flew into the mountain. Unfortunately, this is true. Now, here we go. This is a funny one. This guy won the lottery, the US lottery, of 125 million. He got the first prize. Then he quit his job, and he went and dumped truckloads of cow manure into his boss's garden, and he got arrested for it. It's cute, isn't it? Actually, is it true or false? True. I'm afraid it's false. <laughs> Actually, in 2018, this was the most distributed, most hit fake news in 2018. It got over two and a half million forwards, and it got over 10 million, if I'm not mistaken. I, I, I'm not sure about the exact number. 10 million hits. It's actually funny, you know. Maybe it's a cute idea. Maybe we should think about it if we dislike our boss. Huh? But it's not true. But here we go. This is what news is all about. How do we know how we distinguish what is fake and what is real? Actually, there's a saying, the more we see fake news, the less fake it becomes. You know, teenagers... And those in their early 20s, and we have some among them here, they get their news almost entirely from social media, not Facebook, not Twitter. This is for oldies. Yeah, uh, <laughs> pastor agrees. They get their news from YouTube, Instagram, WhatsApp, and there are a number of other um, social means, which uh, Snapchat and other things, which we probably don't even know how to download. Now, the, new, the news they get is almost entirely visual, and the packaging, how the news is packaged, is more important than actually the content. The Economist, together with two universities, one in the US and one in the UK, did a study and found out that the teenagers and young adults, or the, the, the ones in the early 20s, spend an average of seven and a half hours a day in looking at screens. So the screen becomes, or whatever is on the screen, becomes the news. And the more the news is shared, especially by, if they receive the news by a friend whom they trust or by a celebrity, the more they believe that the news. 
whether it's true or not. So the more we see the news, the less it becomes uh, fake. Actually, these youngsters have no clue what BBC is, or New York Times, or Wall Street Journal. This is for the old guys. Now, could it be that fake news already existed long time ago? If we think we do things new, yeah, we have certain things which we didn't have 2,000 years ago, but there is a saying or a tendency that history repeats itself. So maybe things we experience today are not that new. Maybe they already existed before. So here we go, one of them. In Mark 16, verses 9 to 11, we read, When Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him and who were mourning and weeping when they heard that Jesus was alive and that she had seen him, they did not believe it. Now we know the story. Thereafter, Jesus appeared to two of them while they were walking. These two went back and reported it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. So they were very suspicious and they thought it's not good to just believe everything. Now, did the disciples feel that the news about Jesus' resurrection was simply a hoax, orchestrated by some well-meaning followers? Could fake news during that time be one of the reasons why even those closest to him had trouble believing it? We don't know, but... Rumors have gone around as long as mankind exists. And rumors, as we all know, are usually mostly not true. So it makes sense to be discerning what I believe and what I don't believe. Now, the most perplexing about this is actually that Christ had been predicting his death and resurrection for quite some time before the actual events of that fateful week. Because he told, yeah, we, yeah, sorry about that. We ha he told the disciples following, in Matthew 16, 21, he said, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. He told them they knew, and yet they did not believe. So the question remains, why wasn't Jesus believed? Now, it's easy for us to say it was a lack of faith to trust Jesus that he would rise again. If they had believed, they would have camped in front of his tomb and actually waited for him to get out of the tomb on the third day. But we all know that was not the case. It was basically when he rose from the death, there was uh, nobody there except the guard, and that was it. And when Mary came, he appeared to her. She was convinced. She ran back. She told them they didn't believe. Later, Jesus appeared to the eleven as they were eating. He rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. After all these evidences, we have difficulties to understand why the disciples did not believe. But let's be honest, would we have believed? If we had been in the shoes of the disciples and we would have been told that there is a guy who actually rose from the dead, would we have believed it? Or would we have been skeptical? 
So I'm careful to judge the disciples. Sometimes we're very fast, you know, it's so obvious. They should have seen, they should have known he said it, but yet, if I put myself into the shoes of the disciples, I'm not sure whether I, have, whether I wouldn't have reacted exactly the same way. Now notice the text, 11. So there was one guy missing. Now we know the, the one guy. We all know the story. So the next one slide. Thomas, one of the 12, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord, but he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. <laughs> when Thomas finally had the opportunity to meet Jesus, put his hands, his fingers into Jesus' hands. He said to him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Now blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And that is where the difficult part begins. We have this common expression, I believe it when I see it. Very honest, huh? That's what we actually say very often. I actually do. How come, you know, when you go to the supermarket and you buy, and I'm sorry, my Sabbath school class probably has heard this analogy before, so I'm sorry if I repeat myself. If you go to the supermarket and buy a bag of 5 kg of rice, do you go home and put it on a scale only to realize it's only 4.95 kilos? No, you don't. You just believe it. But you could have the opportunity to actually scale it, to weigh it, but you don't. But have you noticed, it's just on a side remark, that actually the price stays the same, but the bags are getting smaller? Have you noticed that? You know what this is called? This is not called... Inflation. Inflation would be when the price goes up, but the price actually stays the same. So this is called shrinkflation. Okay? The bags shrink. You have less, but you still pay the same. Anyway, having said that, the challenge remains to believe without seeing. Now, here comes the challenge. Jesus said he will be coming again. Do you believe it? It becomes crucial. You know, for us sitting here, it's actually useless if we don't believe that. Because then the whole idea of Jesus having saved us and delivered us from the sins and taking us home to his kingdom is too tight. So yeah, we better believe. So one guy told me once, you see, even if it is not true, I better believe it, because if it is true, I better be there. <laughs> yeah, well, that's also an argument, but in my case, I would suggest we better take this for granted. But here comes the challenge. Jesus said he would be coming for everybody to see. How is this possible? As we have seen in the video by the BBC, the uh, earth is round. So no matter from where Jesus comes, some parts of the world cannot see him. Unless there are still people who believe the earth is flat. Unless Jesus is going to flatten the world, and then everybody can see him. But maybe there are other means. You know, with today's social media and uh, screens where we all look at, actually, not only the youngsters, it could very well be that we actually can see Jesus just as, a, as an idea. Everybody can see him. Because I believe 
if I read the statistic correctly, about 80% of the world population nowadays has smartphones. So, to believe that Jesus comes again for everybody to see requires trust. Trust in his words and trust that what he says is real. Jesus also said there will be impostors, fakes, the ones who will actually behave like he, they were Jesus, but they are not. So here comes the challenge. How do we distinguish? Three years ago, I had the honor, pleasure, or curiosity, whatever you want to call it, of meeting the first cyborg. This is real, huh? This is not fake. <laughs> Neil Harbison had a chip implanted into his brain. Uh, actually, that thing which sticks out of his head goes actually into his brain. He told me that um, he had some difficulties to find a surgeon who was willing to do it, to implant it. But eventually, he was successful. He got it. The chip has a telephone number. You can actually call him. You can call Neil, the cyborg. He calls him officially the cyborg. He claims he knows who calls him according to the variations in vibration. Crazy? Maybe. Maybe not in a few years' time. Technology continues. He had this chip implanted about six years ago. Today, we have progressed more. It could absolutely possible, I'm just guessing, with today, with technology in the future, that you can communicate with each other brainwaves to brainwaves. Now, let me just tell you this. Jesus has untested possibil possibilities to reveal himself. Possibilities we don't possibly even can think of today. We just have to be open-minded and have to trust him. Trust him that what he says is real. Now, trust is a personal thing. In Hebrew 11, it says, Six, without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. It is between me and Jesus. I, if I earnestly seek him, that's the only possibility how I can learn about him and how I get, can, can get closer to him. It is through my personal relationship with Jesus that I will experience small and maybe also bigger blessings in my life. It is this personal relationship between me and Jesus which is the key. The next one is a real story. It happened about 30 years ago. It's not fake. I think I have to do this disclaimer now after everything what I said. Huh? Lenora used to accompany her husband on his annual fishing trips. On the boat they went out to sea with was a boat girl or captain's mate, as they called her. She was always upbeat, energetic, and helpful. Lenora learned that Carla, that was her name, was 16 years old and had quit school. A couple of years later, Lenora noticed that Carla was increasingly distracted and tired. And one day when they got back to shore, Lenora would see her leave with several men. Carla also increasingly showed up late for work, or not at all. 
The next summer, Carla was nowhere to be seen and was not on the boat at all. One summer later, you remember this is an annual fishing trip to the same location the husband has done every year. Lenora asked for Carla's address at the boat office and was given direction to her house. She lived with her mother in a very simple shack. When, Laura found, when Lenora found the house, nobody was home, so she left. But after she got home, after the vacation, the fishing trip vacation, she couldn't get Clara, Carla sorry, off her mind. She made it a matter of prayer, and the, the Holy Spirit impressed her to write Carla a simple letter. Dear Carla, God loves you very much, and so do I. Jesus died on the cross to save you, to forgive your sins, and for you to live in heaven with him. Just ask Jesus into your heart and life. Love, Lenora. She didn't have the address of the girl. She didn't have the address of this house. So she sent the letter to the boat club. The next summer, one day coming off the boat again after a fishing day, Lenora noticed someone sitting in a wheelchair near the beach. Walking closer, Lenora realized it was Carla. She hugged her, but Carla said, don't touch me, I have AIDS. Why would you want me hug? Why would you hug? Why would you want me to hug? Sorry, why would you want to hug me? Now I got it right. I love you, Lenora replied, and so does Jesus. I know, Carla said, you told me in your letter. I'm not supposed to be here, Carla said. I'm here because I was hoping I would see you. I wanted to thank you for the letter. It changed my life. Then she turned around and wheeled herself hurriedly away. Carla passed away three weeks later. She was 23 years old. She said Lenora's letter changed her life. Lenora knew Carla's life was changed by Jesus. She was merely the tool. She was merely the delivery of the message, the messenger. Lenora is grateful to have listened to the Holy Spirit. It is my wish for all of us today that we listen more to what the Holy Spirit has to tell us. Amen. Thank you, Uncle Rolf, for the message this afternoon. May we please rise for the closing song, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus.
dear Father in heaven, we thank you that you accept us the way we are, that you've died for us, that we know we are yours if we accept you. We thank you that we can believe and trust in you, and we ask you that you help us to become more receptive day by day for what you want to t tell us and what your Holy Spirit wants to teach us. Please, let us be open so that when you talk to us, we hear and we follow. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.